Dr. Ryan Stanton, and it's time for some ASEP Frontline. In this episode, uh, number three of our talks from SEC ASEP 2018, this one in the evolution of education, really just more of a timeline um, as part of the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the American College of Emergency Physicians. We do an evolution of education of how we've progressed in medical education, where we're going, and some of the considerations to think about. And um, this is very much my opinions based on some facts and history and some little data points, um, but also where I feel like things are going and uh, some of the considerations we need to make for the modern learner um, with some input from some very influential folks throughout the education community and emergency medicine. Um, So the evolution of education from SEC ASAP 18. Uh, Enjoy. All right. We're getting set up here. Several microphones, because this will end up being a podcast here at some point. So um, I am Ryan Stanton. Um, that is my podcast <laughs> up there. The hope you had listened in. And what we're going to do today is, as many of you know, we are this year is the 50th anniversary of the American College of Emergency Physicians. And w- is my mic's not on. Well, one of them is, just not the one y'all hear. Great, now I don't have to yell. All right, so 50th anniversary of the American College of Emergency Physicians this year. That's kind of where this idea then and now for this uh, conference came from. And what I want to talk about is the evolution of the learner, the evolution of education. Most of us, unless you are just into as a student or a residency, you haven't really seen this evolution, but me just being in 15 years, have seen a significant change in the way we learn and educate. Actually, tomorrow for my talks, I brought my family down here, including my parents, and uh, my dad's gonna come into the talks tomorrow. He's 49 years into medicine um, as a vascular surgeon, and we're gonna talk about probably some of the things that he learned and how that is now different. But today I wanna talk about how things have changed in terms of our education and learning. I don't have any conflicts. So the evolution of medicine, history of medical education, knowledge, translation. Um, With that being in mind, um, if you guys don't listen to the Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine by Ken Milne out uh, uh, out of Canada, you need to. Fantastic podcast, really breaks down a lot of this knowledge stuff. It's a fantastic thing that I listen to all the time how we learn, the context uh, and of the modern learner, and the take-home points we want you to know about. So the early days of medicine, we've all seen the shows. I don't know how many, guys, uh, how many of you folks have uh, seen The Nick or some of those programs like that that kind of highlight the old school education where you had the literal theater where everybody watched as you did a case and you learned from it. You learned hands-on with experience by reading books Um, in through lecture type formats because the access to um, information was limited. How you got the information, there's only a few ways you could get that information. But even back further, let's go back to the birth of medicine, at least modern medicine. Quote fingers on that. First known dentistry, 7000 BC, Baluchistan. I think that was made up actually. I don't know that that actually existed. But some of you folks may be able to tell me if that really did or not. Where Neolithic dentists used flint tip drills and bowstrings, the first known uh, trepanning operation, 5000 BC. That's the one that we always see on the history shows where people decided to drill holes in people's heads um, with, uh, with, with pieces of rock and things like that. It's, it seems wonderful. And we're worried about you know, you know, a two out of 10 pain now. But you know, back then, you can get your skull drilled with a piece of rock. 2600 BC, the Egyptian Imhotep. Uh, described the diagnosis and treatment of 200 diseases. That's Imhotep from the movie The Mummy in the upper right. That's not an actual picture of Imhotep. Um, That is an actor. So don't take that home that you learn that here first. 460 BC, birth of Hippocrates. We all know about Hippocrates. It's basically um, how we gauge a lot of our our modern medicine, the Greek father of medicine. Scientific study of medicine uh, prescribed the very early forms of aspirin. In 300 BC, Diocles wrote the first known anatomy book. So, you know, we've got about anywhere from about 2300 to 
4,500, 5,000 years of medicine in evolution, but really it's been about the last 100, 150 years that we've really gotten rolling, that we've really started to advance medicine and the way we learn medicine. When I started, and almost everybody in this room was in the same thing, you had your lectures, you had your labs, you had your microscope where you're looking at slides underneath, you had your basic sciences where you uh, went through each class in sequence, um, and we all learned the exact same way. One prescription, it was, it was a cookbook, and we all ate from the same recipe. There was no variation, very little variation, no matter where you went. We spent hours in medical libraries, places that you would go to find actual books. And I still remember having to go into the library and find specific articles to copy and print so I could do a report or I could write something about some sort of uh, topic that I want to read about. Let's go spend hours in there to find 15 different articles on, just like our last talk, on DKA. We'll go read about that. So I've got to go actually find the journal off the wall and find the librarian. Really young people, I don't even know if you know what a librarian is. Anybody? We had to find them, and they had to help us find things. I mean, if we ever get to the apocalypse, us older folks, we could survive by communicating through the Dewey Decimal System. It would be fantastic. Nobody know what the hell we're talking about. <laughs> we all had the same recipe. We all theoretically came from the same backgrounds, a science background. You started from very young, I'm going to go into medicine, so everything about my life is going to be medicine. Science is background. We had our basic sciences taught subject by subject in a linear fashion. We had clinical rotations, then we had our internship, then we had residency, we did a little moonlighting here and there, then making a little extra cheddar, then we'd go to attending, then we'd retire, and then we'd die. That was our role. That's what we did <laughs> as physicians. But as with everything else, we've evolved. Everybody here, almost, started off with a phone attached to the wall with a 50-foot cord that would always get tangled. And when you were a teenager, your parents would find you talking because they would follow the trail of the cord that weaved all the way through the house and finally you sitting in some corner somewhere. Now we have a phone with us every single moment of every single day that our phones have probably more data capacity than the entire community did with our computers, our first computers that we had um, with MS-DOS systems. In our evolution, as we go from chimpanzees to upright to the top of the uh, food chain, and now we're going back down again because we're all leaned over looking at our phones. So evolution for better or for worse. We've gone from books to now we're getting information through things such as podcast. Yahoo's like me that do silly things on, that record and do things and send them out. Um, but it's very different. It's for better or worse. It's great that you have access to information with the FOMED movement, with the free open access medical education, but also how is that vetted? How do we know that it's accurate? How do we know that it's evidence-based? How do we know that it's truly um, medical information and education rather than opinion and um, driven by some sort of motive? That's what I tell everybody when they start getting into podcasts. Pick podcasts that you enjoy, you like the topics, but only use that as inspiration to look deeper. You have to be able to get the information, but then confirm the information and find the sources for that information. There's certain things that, certain podcasts that I've listened to before, that I've stopped listen to, listening to, because I felt like it got more off into uh, opinion-based and kind of off-the-wall stuff. And there's others that get so deep in the weeds that, you know, that I like it because it kind of breaks things down for me. That's why I like the s -Gen. It's because he breaks it down for me in a way that I can understand it and gets really down to the practical aspect of things. Our biggest challenge is that we have knowledge at our fingertips every single second of every single day. We have the world's libraries available to us at every moment. But the challenge that presents to us is how do we actually apply that knowledge? How do we confirm the accuracy of knowledge? How do we actually contextualize that knowledge? I think one of the biggest challenges we face in modern medicine 
is the fact that everybody has access to all the information that we have, but they don't know how to apply it. Dr. Google, who refers to us on a regular basis, based on search terms, shock factor, concerns, and that every single possible thing that's going to happen to you today, including breathing, is going to kill you. And so you must go to the ER right away. So how do we use that knowledge? How do we apply that knowledge? And how do we actually supply that knowledge to the learners and to us as physicians as we practice and nurse practitioners and physician's assistants to apply to our daily roles? We're almost to the point now with the old saying that it's like drinking through a fire hose. How do we actually narrow down that data and that bandwidth to a point that we can actually digest it and use it in our clinical practices? So modern learning and access to information is unparalleled to anything we've ever had in human history. Estimated that the internet grows by 44 billion gigabytes every single day, and it's going to grow even more, 10 times that, by 2025. So it's growing faster than we could even ever try to keep up. It's impossible to keep up with all that data that's out there. We have access to almost every type of medical information, new, old, everywhere in between, at our fingertips, even without knowing whether it's vetted, right, or wrong, or otherwise. And that's one of the challenges we'll talk about, is things are reaching us much faster than they ever have in the past, and now we're responsible for doing a lot of that vetting of information, rather than what it was back in the good old days, plus minus good old days, by having it vetted through 10 to 15 years of accommodations and everybody else before it made it to us. So what does it mean? What it means is that we're taking stuff that used to take decades to evolve in terms of information and translating it now not to years, not to months, but into days. One of the greatest levels of um, peer review is now not a journal, it's now turned into Twitter. Twitter is vetting a lot of medical information where folks get on there and have a public forum, sometimes civil, many times not, on the viability and usefulness of the data that's out there. Social media, podcasts, even the, even the evolution of our conferences. And when you look at like this, I still remember when I was 12 years old going out to San Francisco, um, listening to my dad talk about vascular surgery, and as you know, as a 12-year-old, vascular surgery is just riveting data and information. I felt bad falling asleep, but I did. But he knew it. That's okay. We traveled, and, you know, it was a slide deck, and you'd have physical slides. You know, we can actually edit our talks here up until the very moment that we're going to talk. But when you were then you actually had a physical slide that you made that slid into this and <laughs> halfway through every talk the light would go out and you'd have to replace that light. Very simple, very, you know, words on a screen, occasionally some pictures and things like that. But now we've got all these flashy images and flashy things. But has anybody here gone to SMAC? So uh, SMAC, Social Media and Critical Care, is a conference that's uh, critical care folks, emergency medicine, anesthesia, it's put on by some folks out of Australia. Fantastic conference. I've gone the last, uh, last three, two years. Last year it was in Germany. So you don't, have to pull, you don't have to pull too hard to get me to go to these conferences. Next year it's actually in Sydney, Australia. You know, don't have to twist me too hard to get the whole family out there. But it was in, it was, it was in uh, Berlin this last year. The initial talk had a fake helicopter. They cut a car on stage, doing an, they, they did an, a complete extraction response while somebody talked with lights and fireworks and all kinds of stuff. You know, it's, learning is turning into experience. People want to have a show. They don't just want to listen and, and lecture and, and read and the old traditional words on the screen. They actually want entire experience when they go. Everything is turning into a show. You see that now with getting asked, you know, you can't just ask somebody to do a prom now. You have, to put on, you have to put on Hamilton for them, for them to go. <laughs> you don't just say it's a boy or it's a girl. You have, to, you have to do a whole production. You have to get Martin Scorsese there to produce the, the entire event. And that's a challenge. Is, is that we, there's so much more that people are expecting now when they go into learning opportunities. 
And interestingly, medicine has always been this hierarchy. That as you grow experience, you teach the next generations as you go. But we're having this flip now where we have this whole younger generation, which I'm kind of stuck in the middle. You got this whole younger generation that is gathering all of this information and gathering all this knowledge and pulling in all of this stuff. And I don't know how many people here have in their practice have had somebody come up and say, hey, I heard this. I read this on Twitter. I was wondering if we could try it. Or I heard it on this podcast. What do you think about it? And I even get it every once in a while when stuff's asked to me as well. I was like, oh, let me... Yeah, that sounds great. Even patients coming in. Hey, I heard about this. What do you think? I said, that's, that's, well, let's talk about it. I'll be right back in Google. <laughs> and so we have to learn about a lot of the medicines now. So we have this weird kind of oil and water interaction between generations as we have traditional learning styles versus these new learning styles and everything in between of how people get information and how things flow. And I think we can actually use that. I think we can use that to advance everybody. I think there's a lot of things that the well-weathered, experienced physicians and other providers can provide to the new in terms of experiences and the way you learn and the way you have dedication. And I think there's wonderful things the younger generations can teach our more experienced staff as well by seeing these new things, exposing them to new ways to get information. So I think there's wonderful ways that we can get information. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this bi-directional learning. I can teach you, but you can teach me as well. That's why I love having students in my emergency department. I'm in a community hospital. I'm not an academic center, but I'm still adjunct faculty for a PA school and occasionally get some uh, uh, MD students as well because I love the information they bring, the questions they ask, the way they see it a little bit differently than we saw it coming through in the traditional lecture style of learning medicine and the traditional rotations. But also think we have to be careful about not getting ahead of yourself, not getting over your skis. Anybody who skis here, you know you get over your skis, bad things happen. You know, gravity takes over from there and it's a show. You just hope somebody tapes it. There's possible widespread adoption before there's actually adequate vetting. Can we pull something in and actually start using some sort of practice before it actually is ready for prime time? And what I find in medicine, is it easier to do or is it easier to undo something? It's much easier to prevent something from happening than once it's already adopted in practices, bring it back. We can see that, and we'll talk about it more tomorrow with the opioid issue. You can see how hard it is to undo something that's already in practice. It's very hard to change ingrained uh, mindsets and approaches to, to treatments. It's cutting edge, but it isn't ready for prime time. I mentioned that comment that we get often. Have you, I heard this on a podcast wondering if we could do it. You know, delayed sequence intubations. Um, of course, ketamine is one that's been um, the love child of, of social media. It's, it's great for everything. You know, it's, it's spray everybody. With, I mean, it used to be, we always talked about aerosolizing Valium in the waiting room. Now it's like ketamine. Everybody needs ketamine. I'm stressed, so give me a little ketamine. That's whatever. And so it, it gets pushed that far. But we do need to evolve that teaching method. We need to move past that one size fits most idea of lectures. I, do, I don't do well in lectures. I didn't do well in medical school um, from the lecture standpoint. Mine's always racing, hard time sitting down. And that's the way with many emergency physicians. We are not the sit down and let's talk about it for eight hours kind of people. Where the, let's get about 15 minutes into it. That's a re, there's a good reason the lectures here are 30 minutes. It's not because that's all we have to say. It's just because that's all you're willing to hear. And we gotta, then we got to take a break and walk it off a little bit. And that's what we're going to do right after I'm done. Assurance of quality. Is the source of evidence based, or is it opinion, or is it neither? We need to make sure we have a, a, a good basis for that knowledge we have. And are we going to have widening gaps? Are we going to have widening gaps in the education of folks that that aren't adopters of all of this information that's coming in versus those generations now that are picking up a lot of stuff very quickly. There's actually research on this that shows that, that the lack of benefit of these standard learning techniques versus actually engaging the students and engaging the learners 
and getting that two-way street. I don't know if you guys have realized that, uh, does anybody have ATLS coming up? ATLS changes this month. Our June is our first class that so we're changing an instructor for ATLS. They're changing the entire teaching method. They're flipping the classroom. It's gonna be interactive, and we're gonna talk about a little bit of that here in a minute, but they're changing the entire approach to ATLS because of this change in the way that our learners, the expectation of our learners. There's some good things about that, but there's some weakness to that as well. Now more than ever, though, we have to always be learners. We have to always be engaged with our learning and our education process. We always, a physician is a teacher, that's what it means technically, but also what we are as learners. If you, don't, if you don't go into every single shift wanting to learn something new, or seeing something in a different angle, you're gonna likely miss something. I don't have a single shift now that something is in a little different than some way I've seen it before. And I was actually thinking about it last night in terms of education. You know, the amount of education that goes into becoming an emergency physician, I think uh, I calculated in my two years, my third and fourth year of medical school, year of surgery, and then th three years of emergency medicine, is about 24,000 hours of training to become an emergency physician. And now 10 years into that, after all of that, I still see stuff that I'm like, oh my God, what in the world just happened? What is that? And I don't know how many of you are on the EM Docs page and you see people sharing information of what can I do about this or what do you think about this? And the cool thing is about that platform is somebody knows what it is. And so I can spill it out there in the middle of the night and get that information and feedback back that says, yes, I saw this in South Dakota a number of years ago. This is what this is, this is what we did. You can learn from that. And I think that's fantastic. So we always have to be learners. We always have to bring in new information. Also now, if you're not pushing the curve, you're gonna be behind the curve. You can't take a four, two or three or four or five year break from learning and expect to still be a cutting edge physician in, in emergency medicine or any, any area of medicine. You're gonna get left behind. We're gonna talk about tomorrow some of the things that have completely turned 180. Those things that we learned in medical school and residency and in practice, and I'm sure everybody else in every other form of, of professional school when it comes to medicine learned as well that was absolute crap. The myths, whether it's epinephrine in your digits, whether it's backboards, whether it's whatever, we're gonna learn some of that stuff tomorrow that, that just by if you sat on your laurels, you're gonna find out that you're actually behind the curve, significantly behind the curve. So it may be medical gospel today is gonna to be heresy tomorrow. I don't know where I learned this or who said it or if I made it up. It may be, I don't think I made it up. I know I heard it somewhere. 50% of what we learn will eventually be malpractice. Unfortunately, we just don't know what 50%. So from the time you start practice to the time you end practice, there's gonna be a significant evolution in what we know. Is what you're learning and what you know, is it gonna be truly a gold nugget or is it just gonna be that pyrite? And we heard about just a moment ago with the DKA, you know, some of the things that were absolutes when we started practice that are now falling out. I'm still waiting for epinephrine to finally be put to rest for ACLS. We still do it, yet it, the evidence really isn't there, but we still do it. So is it really going to be evidence-based, beneficial to our, to our patients? Remember, 10 years ago, opioids weren't, weren't addictive. We evolve and we learn. Have an open mind, always question how and why we do the things we do, and of course, don't take anything at face value. Now, one of the people I turned to for this talk was Chris Doty. Chris Doty was the residency director at the University of Kentucky. Fantastic um, guy at, at the evolution of education for his residents and where we are now. Uh, he does Papa's Pearls um, on Twitter. He actually does a fair amount as well. And what he talked about with this education is the one thing we have to think about when we come around with learning is the main thing that it's, it has nothing to do with new. Really what is new is old. And really what your basis for learning is, what's in it for me? When you come to learn here today, you didn't come here to learn 
because of the person beside you. You didn't come to learn for your emergency department. You didn't come learn. You came, what is in it for me? What can make me a better physician, PA, nurse practitioner, student, resident, whatever it is? And he said there's five keys. There's five keys to learning. One's the technology. We know how that's evolving. The community, the impact, collaboration, and service. Those are the five things he feels like that if you gear your education through that, you're going to have success. But we also see a huge drive towards this active learning or flipped classroom. And one of the most challenging, the most challenging things that we haven't been able to solve yet is that flipped classroom is that requires work beforehand. And that's where ATLS is going. It, this flipped classroom, this interactive didactic discussion, not where I'm up here talking, but you are teaching me the information requires you to do the work beforehand. That was one of the biggest complaints we had about my surgery program that I was in, is they didn't expect us to know it when we went into surgery. I was in there for a year, they, they came in and they would teach you as you went, and that was a big complaint. Like, we want you to grill us, we want you to pimp us nonstop and make us look like idiots in the OR because we want to learn it beforehand. We want to have the motivation to learn it beforehand. And unfortunately, there's, we, we almost had to turn to that whole, you're going to have to make us feel bad to make us want to learn it. And that's a terrible way to think about things. But that's what we see with this whole flipped classroom. There's actually pushback against that. Even though everybody wants it, there's pushback against it because people aren't willing to do the work beforehand. So how do we motivate people to do the work beforehand in order to have that interactive flipped classroom type mindset that everybody seems to want? And that is one of the challenges. So... <laughs> What, what you can take home from this, it's really just more to open your eyes. It's, it's more just to understand this evolution that's changing, that if you've been practicing 20, 25 years, those students and residents and folks that are coming into your departments are going to be seeing things a little bit differently. If you're a young person and you're in your medical school, you're in residency, understand where our more seasoned physicians, PAs, nurse practitioners come from and understand the value of what they learn and the way that they can break down information and look into deep into articles just because you used to have to go to the library to find that information as opposed to being able to find it right there on your cell phone in front of you. That we can both learn from each other. It is evolving as it should be. We did a lot of things that weren't quite the best way and the more we evolve and the more we understand the way the human mind and uh, works, learning works, we can actually gear our goals towards the individual audience that we're talking to. Information is everywhere. It's good and bad. I can find a pro and con for almost every single thing out there at any given moment right now on the internet. I can prove it and disprove it. And that's the problem with our modern dissemination of information is all based on how you want to present it and the information you want to use to base that opinion. Medicine is more than science and a stethoscope. It's also going to be continually learning, continuing what we can do better for our patients. And unfortunately, don't put your faith in false idols. It's only as good, the truth is only as good as the facts that support that information. As I said, and you get on social media as one of the worst for it, they can, you can support almost any opinion based on selective use of the data points that you want to find. What is standards may be malpractice tomorrow, so don't hold too tightly to any information and truth that you may have, because by tomorrow that may be disproven, whether that involves opioid, whether that's backboards, whether that's whatever it may be. And we must always, and we must live as not only educators and teachers, but we also must live as students to help learn and continue to evolve our education. Even if you've got gray hair or no hair, no hair, You've got some experience, but that doesn't mean we've we got to stop learning. You know, we have to continue to learn. We have to continue to evolve. We have to continue to understand what we can do better because that's how we're going to provide better care for our patients. We've, been, we've lived in a wonderful time that medicine is evolving very quickly. And whether everything, decision we've made is right or could be a little bit wrong, you know, we have the opportunity to advance more in this generation of physicians and healthcare providers than we have in any other uh, era of modern medicine. 
we can do more and it's going to continue to get faster. We can do more and do better for each of the patients that we see. Just remember, medicine isn't about the knowledge up here. It's about that relationship with that patient that's sitting in front of you. And that one patient, it's what can you do for them? You know, with education, it's what can you do for me? But for us, as, as once we go back to our practice, it's what can you do for that person? And it may not always be a pill. It may not, also, it may not always be a procedure. It may not always be an intervention. It may just be information. It may be education. It may be guidance. It may be support. Whatever that may be and whatever we may provide, we are much more than just prescribers and proceduralist. We are much, much more. And that's what we have to learn, and that's what we have to continue to evolve in learning. With that in mind, I appreciate everybody. Thanks once again for coming down. For the new speakers, you will learn that you do not wear a suit to Southern Florida in June. I made that mistake the first year. I will not make that mistake again. Um, I appreciate everything. I appreciate getting back down here again and welcome any questions or thoughts or tomato throwing that you may throw at us. Thanks. The SEC ASAP Evolution of Education from Destin, Florida in June of 2018. I invite your comments and suggestions at youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. That's youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. Follow along as well at Everyday Med on Twitter and the ASAP Frontline Facebook page. And until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline.